Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy. The list of articles which has been chosen for today's analysis along with the page numbers of Chennai, Bengaluru, Delhi and Thiruvananthapuram editions are provided here. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping for the displayed articles is given in the description box below. And for the benefit of smartphone users, the timestamping is also given in the comment section. Let's move on to our first article analysis. The first news article is about the Great Indian Bustard. The syllabus relevant to this article discussion is given here for your reference. The news article states that the National Green Tribunal has directed the centre to prepare a time-bound action plan for the protection of Great Indian Bustards. This plan has to be drafted within two months. Now, the National Green Tribunal has ordered this because of high mortality rate that is high death rate of the Great Indian Bustards. Along with this, the National Green Tribunal bench has also constituted a joint committee to prepare an action plan for the implementation of suggestions given by the Wildlife Institute of India. This committee comprises of officials from the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, then from Ministry of Power and then also from the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. Now let us see about the Great Indian Bustard the threats faced by the bird and the suggestions given by the World Life Institute of India. The Great Indian Bustard is a bird. It is one of the rarest bird in the world. Its scientific name is Ardiotis nigriceps. It is the state bird of Rajasthan. Now this map gives the distribution of this species. As you can see in this map, historically the Great Indian Bustard was distributed throughout the western half of India. It was found in 11 states from Punjab and Haryana in the north to Tamil Nadu in south and then from Gujarat and Rajasthan in west to Odisha in east. But in the last three decades, there is a drastic reduction in this species habitation. As you can see, the current distribution of the species is restricted to fragmented pockets in six states of the country. The largest global population of the species is found in Rajasthan. There are between 100 to 125 birds in the desert national park in the districts of Jaisalmer and Barmer along with the agro-pastoral landscapes of Bikaner in Rajasthan. Agro-pastoral means the practice of agriculture that includes both the growing of crops and the raising of livestock. Then some 25 to 50 birds are found in Ajmer, Pali and Tonk districts of Rajasthan. All other populations have less than 35 birds each. These populations are located within the states of Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, Karnataka and Madhya Pradesh. According to the government data, the Rajasthan and Kutch populations are probably shared with eastern Pakistan where sporadic or occasional and seasonal occurrences of some 15 to 20 bird sightings have been recorded so far. These great Indian bustards or GIB generally favor flat open landscapes which have minimal visual obstruction and less disturbance. Earlier habitat studies found that great Indian bustard typically use arid and semi-arid areas that are dominated by grasslands having 30 to 70 centimeter height. They choose this 30 to 70 centimeter height grasslands because they will have minimal visual obstruction. But also remember that its habitat requirements may vary with season and behavior. It is also known to nest in open barren land during summer and they tend to avoid grasses above 1 meter height because they obstruct the visualization and they also avoid dense scrub like Prosopis julifora. This great Indian bustard is a diurnal species that is it is typically active in the daytime. This species is omnivorous. It feeds on plant matter such as grass seeds, agricultural crops such as uh, groundnuts, millets and legumes, then on insects, lizards and rodents. Some researchers also say that this species is a desert adapted species. That is, it is adapted to the desert culture. So, it drinks water only if it is available. Then reproduction is slow in this species because the female bustard typically lays a single egg or even rarely two eggs in a secluded open ground and she incubates without any cooperation from the male bustard in the guarding of the nest. So the disturbance to nesting site is a major cause of egg and chick mortality. This is also a reason why its population is not increasing. Next let us see the threats 
to this species. Historically, great Indian bustard have been hunted as a game bird and it continues to be hunted in neighboring Pakistan even today. Then low intensity poaching still persists within India. These poachings happen outside the protected areas. Then another threat is the collection of great Indian bustard eggs for consumption. And this practice is prevalent in some parts of Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. So this directly threatens the breeding success of this species. Moreover, domestic dogs of farmers and free-ranging dogs of villages have caused serious damage to the nest of bustard. In addition to this, unethical photography during the breeding season of bustard often acts as a constant source of disturbance. Along with this, they have faced severe habitat loss and alteration over the recent past from widespread agricultural expansion and mechanization of farming and also from infrastructural development such as irrigation, roads, electric poles, windmills and constructions and also from mining and industrialization. Then another major threat to this uh, species is fatal bird collisions. These birds collide with high tension electric wires, fast moving vehicles and other human structures in the industrial development zones that are near bustard areas. So what is the reason these birds collide with high tension electric wires? It is because bustards have wide sideways vision. The sideways vision is to maximize predator detection but they have a narrow frontal vision. Now because of this and because of the habit of scanning the ground while flying, they cannot detect power lines ahead of them. This makes them vulnerable to collision with power lines. Then as a result, they collide with power lines and die from impact or they get injuries or trauma and they even die due to electrocution. Now to solve this particular problem, some suggestions were given by Wildlife Institute of India, which the National Green Tribunal has asked the center to implement. The suggestions include mitigation measures to reduce power line mortality. It includes undergrounding of cables and fitting overhead wires with bird diverters. A bird diverter is a device that is attached to a power line or any type of wire that is suspended in the air. It is to distract and divert birds away from these power lines. So the bird diverters are the wire markers in the form of spirals, swivels, plates or spears. And the mitigation measures also include avoiding or diverting any new high tension power from the priority Great Indian Bustard habitat. And these habitats have been mapped by Wildlife Institute of India. Now, this is the reason why the Ministry of Power and Renewable Energy are included in the joint committee formed by National Green Tribunal. Now, let us see what are the conservation measures taken to protect this great Indian bustard. The great Indian bustard has been protected in India since independence. Currently, it has got the highest protection status as it is listed in Schedule 1 of the Indian Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Then it is now listed as critically endangered in the IUCN Red List. Then after this, it is also listed in the CMS Convention, that is the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals. And then it is also listed in Appendix 1 of Sites. This great Indian bustard has been identified as one of the species for recovery program under the integrated development of wildlife habitats. Now know that the integrated development of wildlife habitats is a centrally sponsored scheme of the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change. And the recovery program that is mentioned here is the recovery program for critically endangered species and habitats. Under this program, initially 17 species have been identified. And the species include Great Indian Bustard, Manipur Deer Sangai, Gangetic Dolphin, Dugong, Amur Falcon, etc. Now also know that there is no captive population of Great Indian Bustard. This is because few unscientific attempts to breed this species in captivity have failed in the past. So since there is no captive population of Great Indian Bustard, extinction of the species from wild implies total extinction of this species. That is why it is important to take appropriate conservation measures to save this species. With this, we have come to the end of this article discussion. This one previously asked question is given here for your reference. 
The news article talks about a region in the state of Karnataka. This region is called as Hyderabad Karnataka in the state of Karnataka. This region consists of six districts. They are Bidar, Gulbarga, Yadgiri, Raichur, Koppal and Bellari districts. This region was ruled by the Nizam of Hyderabad before the Indian independence. That is the reason for the name of this region as Hyderabad Karnataka. Today the news is that the state cabinet in the state of Karnataka has decided to rename this region as Kalyana Karnataka. Now let us see few historical information about this territory. The territory of Karnataka became independent from the British rule with the rest of the country on August 15, 1947. But this did not happen for the territories under the control of Nizam of Hyderabad. This is because of the then Nizam of the erstwhile state of Hyderabad, Mir Osman Ali Khan Asavja 7. He was not willing to join the territories ruled by him with the Indian Union and he wanted to remain independent. And then he declared Hyderabad as an independent nation on August 15, 1947. Then in June 1948, Mountbatten proposed a deal called as Heads of Agreement Deal. This deal gave the status of an autonomous dominion nation under India to the Nizam's Hyderabad. India was ready to sign the deal and did so, but Nizam still refused. He refused on the grounds that he wanted complete independence or the status of dominion under the British Commonwealth of Nations. Now remember that this British Commonwealth of Nations is now known as Commonwealth Grouping. The Nizam refused for negotiations and it was said that Hyderabad was arming itself with support from Portuguese administration in Goa and the government of Pakistan. This has ultimately led to communal clashes and added more tension in the region. This idea of Hyderabad arming itself with the support from Pakistan did not go well with the Indian government. Sardar Vallabhai Patel described the idea of an independent Hyderabad as an ulcer in the heart of India which needed to be removed surgically. This was not the comment made on the region but it was the comment for the independency of region claimed by Nizam as he decided not to join with India. Then by September 1948, there were reports that Nizam's army was committing atrocities on innocent civilians and there were reports of communal clashes also. After this, India decided to carry out a police action to prevent communal clashes and to stop the atrocities. This police operation is called as Operation Polo. Sometimes it is also called as Operation Caterpillar. This police action began in September 13, 1948 and it lasted till September 18th. During the police action, the Nizam of Hyderabad surrendered and Hyderabad became an Indian territory on September 17 to 18, 1948. This is the reason why the people in this region celebrate Hyderabad Karnataka Liberation Day on 17 September every year, remembering the integration with Indian Union. Some people locally call this day as their Independence Day also. Then, when the news state of Mysore was reorganized in 1956, Karnataka speaking areas of Hyderabad province were added to the new state of Mysore. That part comes under the six districts we mentioned already is called as Hyderabad Karnataka. Now also remember that the name of the state of Mysore was changed to Karnataka in 1973. Now this Hyderabad Karnataka region is considered as one of the backward regions in India and within Karnataka it is the most backward region. Region. One of the reasons for this is poor soil fertility in this region. As a result, agricultural productivity in this region is less. Even after uh, several years of independence, by around 2012, it was reported that the human development indices in this region is below the HDI levels in sub-Saharan Africa. So for the development in the region, the people demanded for special status under the constitution of India. This demand was pending for a long time and finally in 2013, the region of Hyderabad, Karnataka was given special status under Article 371J of Indian Constitution. The Article 371J deals with special provisions with respect to state of Karnataka. This article was inserted into the Constitution by the 98th Constitutional Amendment Act of 2012. This article gives constitutional power to the President of India to give any special responsibility 
ఢిల్లీ టు ది గవర్నర్ ఆఫ్ కర్ణాటక ఫర్ ది డెవలప్మెంట్ ఆఫ్ హైదరాబాద్ కర్ణాటక రీజియన్ దెన్ ది ఆర్టికల్ త్రీ హండ్రెడ్ అండ్ సెవెంటీ వన్ జే క్లాస్ వన్ సబ్ క్లాస్ ఏ ప్రొవైడ్స్ ఫార్ ఎస్టాబ్లిషింగ్ సెపరేట్ డెవలప్మెంట్ బోర్డ్ ఫార్ హైదరాబాద్ కర్ణాటక రీజియన్ ది ఆర్టికల్ ఆల్సో ప్రొవైడ్స్ ఫార్ ఈక్విటబుల్ అలోకేషన్ ఆఫ్ ఫండ్స్ ఫర్ డెవలప్మెంటల్ ఎక్స్పెండిచర్ ఆఫ్ దిస్ రీజియన్ ది ఆర్టికల్ ఆల్సో ప్రొవైడ్స్ ఫార్ ఈక్విటబుల్ ఆపర్చునిటీస్ అండ్ ఫెసిలిటీస్ ఫర్ ది పీపుల్ బిలాంగింగ్ టు దిస్ రీజియన్ దీస్ ఆపర్చునిటీస్ అండ్ ఫెసిలిటీస్ ఆర్ గివెన్ ఇన్ త్రీ మ్యాటర్స్ దే ఆర్ పబ్లిక్ ఎంప్లాయ్మెంట్ ఎడ్యుకేషన్ అండ్ వొకేషనల్ ట్రైనింగ్ దీస్ ఆపర్చునిటీస్ ఆర్ గివెన్ బై అ వే ఆఫ్ పాజిటివ్ డిస్క్రిమినేషన్ దట్ ఇస్ reservation then based on the special provision given by this article the hyderabad karnataka region development board was established on 6th november 2013 the jurisdiction of this board is spread over 40 assembly constituencies of the six districts in the region that is bidar bellari kalaburagi which is also known as gulbarga koppal raichur and yadgir districts now here note that in the constitution under article 371j the name hyderabad karnataka region has not been changed because it will require a constitutional amendment through parliament which may or may not happen in future but right now the state cabinet of karnataka government has decided to change the name within the state as kalyana karnataka with this we have come to the end of this news article discussion the respect practice question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the next article discussion which is based on this editorial which is about india russia relations the discussion can be linked to the syllabus that is given here for your reference we know that recently the prime minister of india has participated in the fifth eastern economic forum this forum was held in russian far eastern region of vladivostok know that this eastern economic forum was set up by the russian president to attract investment to the farthest east siberian and arctic pole areas of russia now during this forum the indian president unveiled the russian edition of india's look east act east policy which is called as act far east our pm has also pledged to extend a line of credit or loc of 1 billion dollars to the russia's far east region now know that this line of credit is not a grant but it is a soft loan which is provided on concessional interest rates by a government to other governments so this has to be repaid by the borrowing government our pm has said that this line of credit will be the take off point for act far east it means it is just beginning in the india's participation in the far east region the line of credit is expected to help finance the indian business projects that are investing in this region and this line of credit will also strengthen the bilateral ties with russia now along with this several other initiatives were taken to increase the value of economic ties between india and russia during this forum currently if you see according to this author at present the value of bilateral trade between the two countries is 10 billion dollars the author says it is far behind the potential compared to the value of our strategic partnership with russia including the defense and security relationship it is because in the past year itself india had defense deals worth 14.5 billion dollars with russia here the defense deals which the author mentions here shall be the s400 deal etc then during this forum india and uh, russia signed many agreements the important agreements were on uh, energy exploration and procurement in that a specific uh, memorandum of understanding that is a mou on cooperation on li- liquefied natural gas supplies to india was signed then another agreement was based on opening a maritime route from vladivostok to chennai which will be used for energy trade as well then another agreement was a five year road map which is for the cooperation on prospecting or searching for hydrocarbons and uh, liquefied natural gas in the far east and the arctic regions of russia these decisions show that india has a specific uh, attention to russia's far east the author says that our pm's pivot or shifting attention to russia's far east has a far reaching strategic implication the author is saying this because now india can access the resources from the arctic region also and we know that this is possible due to the global warming that has increased the accessibility and it has opened more routes to the arctic region it is because the increase in temperature has melted the arctic ice and it has increased the accessibility to that region so the emphasis on energy from this region 
reflects India's desire to diversify its source of energy. Currently, if you see, we are heavily dependent on West Asia for our energy needs. But West Asia is unstable because uh, there is a civil war going on in Yemen and we have problems of US sanctions on import of oil from Iran, etc. So, it is becoming difficult for India to satisfy our energy needs from West Asia. And these new decisions will help us solve our energy needs for the future. Then another strategic implication of this decision is that, according to the author, Russia is seen as a European power in the post-Soviet era, that is, since the dissolution of USSR in 1991. The author says that the investment in the neglected Far East will bring Russia more close to India. And the author is saying that India's move is not just to keep a traditional friend, that is Russia, close to India, but it is also to ensure some space when Russia and China relationship is getting better. It is because Russia has said that it welcomes cooperation with other countries for investments in Far East region. And already countries such as China, Japan, Australia, South Korea, etc. have invested in this region. And according to this author, out of the $33 billion investment in the Far East region, 71% is by China. That is why the author is saying that Russia-China relationship is getting better. Then the author concludes this article by saying that ACT Far East demonstrates and reassures India's commitment to work with Russia in a highly polarized world. And India is confident of working with multiple partners or multiple alignments even if they are at crossroads. It means even if there is a bitter relationship between the US and Russia and their conflicting interests, India can work with them. And this particular move reassures this part. With this, we have come to the end of this article discussion. This news article is based on line of credit to Russia by India, which we discussed during the last article analysis. The discussion can be linked to the syllabus that is given here for your reference. In the editorial analysis, we saw that our Prime Minister has pledged to extend a line of credit of uh, 1 billion dollars to Russia's Far East region or this announcement by our PM has been questioned by opposition parties of our country. Even the article notes that it is the first time India has extended a line of credit to a developing country. It is because usually such assistance is given to the least developed countries. And it is also the first time the line of credit has been given for the development of a particular region of a country, that is to the far east region of Russia. The opposition is saying that India is facing an economic slowdown at present. So they are questioning the rationale or basis on which financing is given for projects in a country like Russia, which has ample resources. According to the opposition parties, it is actually India that needs a stimulus package and not Russia. They are saying this because the GDP per capita of Russia is five times more than that of India, even though the GDP of Russia might be far below India in recent years. Now to this question posed by opposition parties, the External Affairs Ministry has given some reasons. The External Affairs Ministry has said that the decision to extend the line of credit was based on many reasons like China, Japan and Korea have already made huge investments in the resource-rich region that is the Far East region of Russia. So this prompted India to invest considering uh, its energy needs and other needs. And this uh, line of credit will also attract more Indian businesses to this region. Then the another reason given by the External Affairs Ministry is that India and Russia have targets to achieve $30 billion of annual bilateral trade by the year 2025. So the line of credit is expected to increase trade and it will help both the countries to reach this target. And in the beginning, we saw that this region is resource rich region. It is because this region has major natural resource deposits such as oil, natural gas, coal, gold, iron ore, zinc, etc. So increasing the trade with this region will give Indian industries access to these resources. These are the reasons given by the external affairs ministry for extending line of credit to Russia. So now the article also provides some extra information based on line of credit given by India to other countries. The article says that from the year 2005 to 2019, India has extended 274 line of credits 
which are worth 26.79 billion dollars and these line of credits have been given to 63 countries. Among these 274 line of credits, 189 were given to African countries and it was worth 11.36 billion dollars and 53 line of credits worth 14.47 billion dollars is given for Asian countries and the remaining line of credit which is worth 970.53 million dollars is given for Latin America, Oceania and Commonwealth of Independent States. This Commonwealth of Independent States is a regional intergovernmental organization. It was established in the year 1991 and it has 12 member states. They are Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, Russia, Tajikistan, Ukraine, etc. Now know these facts as these will be helpful in your mains answer writing. With this, we have come to the end of this article discussion. Moving on to the final article discussion for the day. This news article provides new information about the settlers who lived in the Indus Valley Civilization. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is given here for your reference. Some history books say that the settlers in the Indus Valley Civilization migrated from steppes in Central Asia or they were descendants of Iranian farmers who migrated towards the Indus Valley. Historically, if this is correct, this means that the civilization aspect of the Indus Valley Civilization was brought by them or significantly contributed by them. Now, let us keep this one as one point. Then another point is in history they say that agriculture tend to have spread in Europe because of migration or influx of people with ancestry in Anatolia. When we say Anatolia, it refers to the modern day Turkey. This means agriculture was spread in Europe in ancient times by the people of Anatolia origin. Now, this news article talks about a research study and its result published in the journal called as Cell. This research provides some answers and additional findings with respect to the about two points and others. This article is published in Cell Journal and it was titled as An Ancient Harappan Genome Lacks Ancestry from Steppe Pastoralists or Iranian Farmers. A team of researchers attempted to generate genome-wide data from skeletal remains of 61 ancient individuals. The skeletal remains of these ancient individuals were taken from the IVC site of Rakhigadi in Haryana. Only a single sample or only one individual gave the required authentic ancient DNA for the research analysis. This individual is from a population which is the largest source of ancestry for South Asians. The findings of this research study are based on the study of the genome of this individual in combination with the available archaeological information. Now, this photograph shows one of the burials from where the skeletal remains were taken for this study. This study provides a fresh light on the Indus Valley Civilization. That is, it provides new information about the Indus Valley Civilization. The new study says that the hunter-gatherers of South Asia who then became settled people in the Indus Valley Civilization have an independent origin. That is, their origin is free from the influence of people from steppes in Central Asia or from even Iranian farmers. The authors say that this finding has negated the hypothesis that there was mass migration from outside South Asia during or before Harappan times and they only built and contributed to this civilization. Now, this news article says that the study also established the genetic continuity from hunter gatherers of South Asia in ancient times prior to Indus Valley civilization to the individuals of time after the Indus Valley civilization. The genetic continuity is also established with individuals of modern times. This means that the same hunter gatherer communities who lived in northwestern region of uh, South Asia have developed into agricultural communities and these communities have formed the Harappan civilization. Now, let us see few information regarding the Indus Valley civilization or IVC. The mature IVC is also known as Harappan civilization. This civilization was spread over northwestern South Asia from 2600 to 1900 BC. The Indus Valley civilization or the Harappan civilization 
is one of the first large scale urban societies of the ancient world we call it civilization because it is characterized by systematic town planning elaborate drainage systems granaries and standardization of weights and measures and few other aspects the inhabitants of the ivc were cosmopolitan with multiple cultural groups living together in large regional urban centers these large regional urban centers were found in harappa mohenjodaro rakhigarhi dolavira and ganwariwala in this image the sites denoted in red and blue fonts are archaeological sites that represent indus valley civilization out of these harappa in the present day is an archaeological site which is located in pakistan punjab then mohenjodaro is also an archaeological site in sindh province of pakistan then rakhigarhi archaeological site is located in haryana in india also dolavira which is found in kutch area of gujarat and uh, ganwariwala which is located in cholistan desert in pakistan now know that cholistan desert is in pakistan next to indian thar desert the harappan civilization was the first major civilization in south asia based on archaeological evidences it is said that it was spread across a vast area in present day india and pakistan in the indian subcontinent region or the south asian region the civilization got its name from the river indus and its valleys as the indus valley civilization is a indus river based civilization now there is slight disagreement in time period among historians in general ivc can be classified into three phases they are the early harappan phase from 3300 to 2600 bce then the mature harappan phase from 2600 to 1900 bce and the late harappan phase from 1900 to 1300 bce now let us discuss about another findings of this study the researchers said that there was a movement of people from east to west which is contrary to some theories because some theories say only people from west asia came to the east that is they came to indus valley civilization now this point is substantiated by the evidence of presence of people from harappan civilization at sites like gonor in turkmenistan and uh, shaharai sokta in far eastern iran these individuals show a mixture of ancestry related to ancient iranians and ancient tribal southern indians the researchers are saying that these persons have moved from indus valley civilization to turkmenistan and far eastern iran because of trade relations it is archaeologically said that the harappans had trade relations with mesopotamia egypt persian gulf and almost all across south asia so the movement of people was bound to occur from the east that is from the ivc to the west that is to turkmenistan and far eastern iran since the movement is from east to west the article says that this acts as a hint that settled life and domestication went from south asia to west asia now let us see what the study has to say about the people with anatolia ancestry in spreading agriculture in three regions of the world the three regions are europe iran and southern central asia and south asia the ancient dna studies in europe have shown that agriculture has spread through the influx of people with ancestry in anatolia anatolia as we saw earlier refers to the modern day turkey a similar dynamic was seen in iran and turan where anatolian related ancestry and farming have arrived now here turan refers to southern central asian region that composes of parts of turkmenistan and other southern central asian territories but if you see in south asia the researchers found an absence of anatolian related ancestry this means the spread of agriculture and the beginning of settled life has no link with anatolian influx meaning there is no such migration of anatolian ancestry into indus valley civilization as it happened in europe iran and southern central asia now let us see what the study has to say about the spread of the indo european languages languages spoken in the south asian region belong to at least four major language families they are indo-european now here know that most of the indo-european family belong to its sub branch indo-aryan 
then comes the next family which is dravidian and then comes austro asiatic and the fourth major language family in south asia region is sino tibetan now some of the indo aryan languages are hindi bangla gujarati marathi kashmiri oriya maithili and others there is one hypothesis called as anatolian hypothesis which says that the spread of these indo european languages was propelled by movements of people from anatolia across the iranian plateau who then came into south asia this hypothesis says that they were associated with the spread of farming during harappan civilization or they were associated in the time which was shortly before it but this hypothesis is negated by this study as we found no anatolian link but this hypothesis is negated by this study as we found no anatolian link in south asian ancestry in harappan times in such case the study explains that the indo european languages have been spread through a natural route from eastern europe via the central asia in the first half of the second millennium bce the first half of the second millennium bce means between the years of 2000 bc to 1500 bc but we know that the mature harappan phase was positioned between 2600 bc to 1900 bc this means the indo european languages were spread by later migrations that happened after the mature phase of indus valley civilization in this way the indo european languages have spread in the south asia region with this we have come to the end of this news article analysis the split practice questions will be discussed in the next session we have come to the last session for the day that is the practice questions discussion session let us see the first question in this question two statements have been given and we have to choose the correct statement the first statement states part 21 of indian constitution deals with temporary transitional and special provisions now this statement is correct the part 21 deals with temporary transitional and special provisions only this part consists of articles 369 to 392 however some articles from 379 to 391 were omitted from the constitution by the 7th constitutional amendment act of 1956 so this statement is correct then the second statement states article 371f in part 21 deals with the special provisions with respect to the states of Sikkim and Karnataka. Now this statement has two parts. First part is Article 371F is in Part 21. Yes, just now we saw that Part 21 consists of articles from 369 to 392, and 371 and all its subsections come under this part only. So this first half is correct. Then the second half of the statement states provision with respect to the states of Sikkim and Karnataka. So today we had a discussion based on the special provisions with respect to Karnataka, and we saw that Article 371 J deals with Karnataka. So that means the second half statement is incorrect. Now remember that Article 371 F deals only with special provisions for Sikkim, and Article 371 J deals with Karnataka. and this article 371j was enacted through 98th constitutional amendment act of 2012 so this statement is wrong here the question asks for the correct statements here statement 1 is the correct statement so our final correct answer to this question is option a one only now look at this second question it states cholistan desert is located in now this desert is located in Pakistan now this region is important because during our discussion we saw that one important large urban center of indus valley civilization was located in archaeological site of ganveriwala which is located in cholistan desert region of pakistan so this archaeological site is important so you should know where this site is located also remember that this desert is also called as rohi desert now all the other options like mongolia botswana Argentina all have deserts Mongolia has Gobi desert and Botswana has the Kalahari desert and we know that Botswana is in the southern region of African continent and then Argentina has Patagonia desert now in this question we have been given five sites and we have to arrange them from north to south these five sites are Indus valley civilization sites 
Now to answer this question let us take the help of the map which we used during our discussion. Now in this map if you see let us draw one line from north to south first. Then let us map where every one of this region is located like Harappa is here then Rakhigadi is here then Mohenjadaro is here then Dholavira is here and then Lothal is here. So now we have arranged sites from north to south in which Harappa is in first then comes Rakhigadi then comes Mohenjadaro then comes Dholavira and then comes Lothal. So our final correct answer should contain 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So option D is the correct answer to this question. With this we have come to the end of our all our sessions. If you like the video don't forget to like, comment and share and do subscribe to Shankara IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates on civil service examination preparation.